Hi, Chris. Hi, David. Hi, blonde Manuel. <laughs> All right. What are you drinking? Are you told me already? Oh, yeah. Well, we should show everybody. All right. So very, very classy. Uh, Talisker. Very nice. Yes. I'm a uh, full bottle so we can measure how much I've had. Yeah. Well, this is this is not a full bottle, unfortunately. So <laughs> I'm, I'm going for some uh, oh, some uh, rye. Some American rye, so the whiskey, nice. whiskey from America. So um, I can't afford the good stuff anymore. I can only get scotch when my parents give it to me. So uh, I don't know where this is made. I guess this is this is made in Denver. So there you go. It's very good. It's very very nice rye. Rye. I've really uh, developed an appreciation of rye and mezcal. A really nice mezcal is wonderful. So I do, I do have water as a backup. Yeah, I should. Uh, <laughs> I have some leftover tea, I think. <laughs> I might just get parched. So. Uh, All right. History or theory? Is it or or versus? Yeah, I think it's or. Yeah, I have. Uh, there's, there's things to say for sure about that. I'm just going to like Say, well, I mean, uh, I, I, the, one of the first things I thought of when I saw this thing was the difference that uh, Latour makes between science and uh, research, that science is very staid and careful and research is uh, risky and subjective. Um, oh. And I don't, know, I, I don't know if I buy that or I don't know, if, but to me, like the history, let's just say the science uh, research history theory is 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 uh, an interesting let's say parallel but has some interesting parallels for for me so that's one thing I thought of the other thing I thought of is that when I was being let's like, trained I, I always thought I was going to get this talk about history like here's what it is and here's how you do it like it was like this talk about sex that you're expecting from your parents you don't really want it but you you sort of need it doing history yeah and I never got it like like really? I think I think I've I've I can't claim like I, I can't claim to be a historian because I don't think I've ever been trained, um, even though I was waiting for it. And um, anyhow, so that's uh, that's that's interesting. And I have to claim I have to claim theory if only because that's the only thing I know how to do. Or even if and I don't know if I do know how to do that either. Was it different with theory? Did someone sit you down and go, "Now, son, you've got to learn about some theory now"? Well, yeah. we, well I mean. Postmodernism. Why well, I gotta talk to you about this? We, I think, like the first day of PhD school, Sylvia Levin like asked everybody, like, "What's a non-theoretical house?" or some question like that, right? Like, so basically, her point was, everything is like everything has to be put in that kind of framework. There's no such thing as, well, there's no such thing as a fact. There's lots of data, and in order to turn it into a fact, you need a theory. I think I don't know if that's what she, that's how I would put it in words now. So, so I think it was also that like I was just like that was the first thing I heard. It was one of the first things I heard. Oh, I was in, in that sure. that level of school for sure. So, so it so was her I, was her reading of what what constituted theory very dominant, or was it a kind of framework that you had to? Uh, I don't like it wasn't like there like that idea that everything needed to be framed and argued was dominant but there wasn't like a way of doing that right and then the, the rest of the semester was like there's this there's this there's this there's this there's this huh. but that was a time um, I don't know if you were like this is what 1996 1997 yeah. and um, was theory, a... theory was something that you brought into the discipline, right? So all the things that were theory was like Heidegger, Deleuze, right? Like it was, it was theory for architecture. The way I talk about it now with my students is theory for architecture. That's what that was versus theory of architecture, which is what's a theory of like plan or section, right? I don't know. These guys have been having these conversations down there about you know axon versus section. Like to me, that that's what are the disciplinary theories versus what are the theories that come from outside and have been used, which, which I've, you know, it didn't start in the nineties, it started before that, but 
but to me it's I didn't that one took a that was a hard that was a good lesson to learn but it took me longer than I thought <laughs> to learn it yeah it still seems I would say it still seems like the latter is more prevalent or the former is more prevalent yeah I think so. uh, theory for architecture um, I mean so, there's very little theory or architectural theory in some ways I would say or or you know the worst kind is when architecture becomes a kind of illustration for theory but I think that's even uh, yeah so prevalent but I, it's it's to what extent do you think that I think one of the tensions is I think one has to really understand design in order to produce architectural theory um, of the second sort that you you described I mean you know you actually have to be engaged in the design process I, I don't this division between I'm a historian or I'm a theorist versus the designer um, seems problematic I mean uh, in that regard um, and yet at the same time it can't become instrumental to design in the same way um, let's say theory is for I guess you know someone in the at that period of time say like Greg Lynn who really you know, I guess they instrumentalized the theory. Though Greg is actually, I th he was very clever with what he was doing. But I mean, it's a, it's a different role, uh, it seems. But it's a very, it's a fine line to thread. I mean, somehow this is related, but I like, like I feel like having lived through that or having been indoctrinated, you know, pro like in totally internalized it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then come out the other side and then you realize like oh well that's the history of the discipline <laughs> meaning like it happened someone forcefully made it happen uh -huh. and then it becomes a f it does become a data point let's say um so uh it becomes part of the historical record or archive and but then those things how you mobilize those things um I don't know if that's theory, but it's definitely not history. Let's put it that way. But, 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 but that being said, like it seems to me, you have to recognize that as, as, uh, what is it? I don't know how I want to say it. It, it happened, right? Like this is like what Latour says about like science. It's not. It's not the end. Of, it's not the end all. But you, it's 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 there, right? It doesn't explain everything, but you can't just like dismiss it away, and right, that's right. a weird. That's like that's the thing about history that's good to me that it's and it's necessary to like have those I don't know points that don't move like are harder to move let's put it that way not for ideological reasons but because like oh yeah that just actually that literally happened and I can't I can't deny that gravity isn't there let's put it like so what what those facts would be or data points in architecture will thought is just would could be interesting to think about not that I have but. Yeah, yeah, I was, there's a, I don't know, I have a couple, I mean, the role of quote unquote theory at that time as well was, seemed often to be about deterritorializing the known, right, or um, the conventions of architecture. And also it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, what had become by then a pretty fixed sort of opposition between say critical practice and normative practice or historical uh, postmodern versus a say critical postmodernism. Um, and so it became a kind of instrument of deterritorialization. Um, and today, I, I think one, one question I have, especially when I'm teaching it to students today is what is its role today when theory has not really been it's not, it doesn't have the same, I don't want to say cachet, but it doesn't have the same uh, imperative uh, that it seemed to have at that time. Um, I wouldn't I mean, it doesn't seem like, um, uh, I mean, its status has shifted a bit. So I often, you know, I'm often, uh, because in a way it's hard to deterritorialize a field that is in, is itself so fluid and its boundaries are so amorphous. Mm -hmm. And there's, uh, I think like uh, my former Dean Sarah Whiting called it a kind of proliferation 
um, you know, where, you know, there used to be very clear, like you're in this camp, that camp, this camp, you're, or you're, you're normative, da, 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 da. And now there's this proliferation of things and it's like browsing, you know, you just browse, you Google image search uh, for an architecture or for an idea. Um, and there's a sort of leveling of the field. Um, and so it's, it actually is sort of deter the discipline is itself uh, in some ways deterritorialized. So I would say not in a kind of interesting way. It's just sort of a, a schmear. Um, so. I think I think that to me gets to this this issue of the theory for or the the need to go outside to find philosophy or whatever it, like some other to like this almost like faith that I was brought up in like that that's the only way to move it out of itself. Mm -hmm. um, you had to go you had to go somewhere else to like it's like fertilizer right like you can't just have the plant and the dirt you need something extra to, to make it grow like as with the with the computer software at the time you know a, a sort yeah, yeah. of technology transfer from uh, hollywood animation into architecture and there's a sort of a technology transfer in a different way from you yeah. know philosophy theory into architecture but i think like i think like right i wonder let's say right now like what's going on in the states in terms of uh the both the pandemic but the combination of the pandemic and the race protests, the police protests, but really racial justice protests. Um, um, it's forced me to like read some things that I, you know, just it seems like, oh yeah, I should read that. Like I should get more uh, educated. And it is presented, let's say, which is an important word, as history, right? And there's like, here's the things in history that all you architects didn't pay attention to. Um, and there's kind of, one of those lines or that I'm like staring at this book over here is is the kind of racism that's in architectural theory texts like by Zemper and Ville Ledoux in particular are the ones that Charles Davis writes about. And uh, that's pretty interesting in the sense like, to, like whereas it's there like you go back to the books you're like holy shit like you find these you find these paragraphs you're like yeah wow that's pretty nasty. Now like Ingraham did this, uh, and Wigley to some extent with uh, with uh, gender, right, uh, as well. But I don't know. Is that a theoretical? Act? You know what I'm saying? Like, like, and, and even like with VLA, is that that's like a th that's a theory of architecture? No, but it's not of because he's basically bringing in racial theories from like other places. I mean, that's like that's the 19th century is also the same. Like that's what I mean by it's not the, the 90s wasn't the first time. Sure, sure. Architecture is going outside of itself to some larger cultural. I mean, I this look, is why this is why I think it's risky and it in in Latour's terms, it's like it's kind of like wild. Well, I've described it as um, the process of interjection, and that's how I that's how I discuss it. Um, you know that there are, uh, and it's a sort of a psychological sort of to lift a sort of psychoanalytic idea. Uh, into the realm of the discipline, which is a little risky itself, but that there are things that there are problems or there are issues that are so um, so endemic to your very possibility of operating in a certain way, right? The, cons the constitution of oneself or the constitution of a discipline, the identity of the discipline as such. Um, there, are, there are certain issues or problems that are so endemic to it. It's like the nose on your face, right? You can't you can't see it because it's 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 right there, um, and that I I often feel like what is off, often called architecture is sort of a, a movement towards other fields, whether it's history, theory, or science, or other other things, is often a process of interjection where there's a problem in those areas that is actually a problem within architecture. Right, but it can't. You can't actually formulate it as such because it's so much a part. It's the nose on your face, but by projecting it into another field, it allows you to see it, interrogate it, and then reincorporate it back into the discipline and uh, change the discipline. It's sort of a mirror. It's like a Lacanian mirror stage, but the mirror is a sort of distorted mirror, right? Because you're you're distorting it through the lens of science or architecture. And so it's not that architecture is so much borrowing science or history or theory, but it's it's interjecting 
this this uh, its own problems through it, um, uh, which might be good or bad. But that's how I sort of end up looking at because we're, we're constantly using science. We're constantly. I mean, you can you can just pick it. We, history and theory have always been. But that's also different than say. But that's different than saying that that architecture has always been steeped within a kind of metaphysical, or uh, what we call a theoretical problem, right? That it's also contemplating and 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 or operating within a cultural envelope, um, which it also is. So I guess, I mean, so it's a. Uh, but okay, but is I guess uh, like what the. the I would, uh, this question of is there's a trajectory, like these are words like that are not quite the same thing. There's a kind of like trajectory of that, that of architecture doing that, or there's a history of architecture doing that, or there's a genealogy of doing that. Meaning like the genealogy part, like you can go back and say, okay, we've been doing this, we've been doing this, we've been doing this. Okay, when did we not do it? Like that, I, I guess, I, I mean, why is that productive? I don't even know. Um, what, what's productive? Like nope. find, finding those moments of fissure, right? The kind of genealogical breaks, like the Foucault method of, uh, of history, I guess you would say. Meaning like w like for, for me to go back or for Charles uh, Davis to go back and say, look, like architecture thinks this way uh, about tectonics from VLA, but where does he get it? He gets it from like someone trying to describe, you know, human bodies. All right. And so if I find that out, Right, I go back to that moment, like, where does it come from? Where's the break before it? Where does it, like, if I get those facts, like, okay, what do I do with those facts? That doesn't automatically tell me like, oh, therefore I have to throw out everything afterwards or, and, and this is like, on the one hand, it's been like so eye-opening to get this historical perspective recently. But on the other hand, I, it doesn't, it, it doesn't do anything by itself. Right. And it seems that, I don't know if that's theory, but let's call it speculating on that or riffing or using that. Oh, here's my cat. Uh, <laughs> my, my dog should come in. We got a puppy I, recently. I don't, like the cat never comes to me when I'm on Zoom, as a matter of fact. Any interesting things. So the cats. Um, oh, the cats are nuzzling you. But this, like, that's why I, maybe today I was thinking about the science research thing, because research, research is always used to, in, to instrumentalize. Um, so like, like history is, is useful, but maybe not, uh, my sense is it's not on its own. Um, and theory, maybe the flip side of that is that theory can be instrumental without having any, <laughs> any weight. It can just be like, yeah, whatever you want. Like we can, we can move things, you can speculate. Like the difference is theory to me does re require some kind of rigor, let's say behind it, or some kind of historical Stopping point. I don't know what word, I, what metaphor I want to use, but like somehow it's a backstop. Like it prevents me from doing whatever I want. Uh huh. Interesting. I mean, so that's interesting. I mean, I often use this idea of uh, you know Slavoj Zizek uh, adopted Donald Rumsfeld's uh, theory of knowledge, um, where he has the things we know we know, the things we don't know we know, and the things we know we don't know. And Zizek points out that he forgot the fourth and most important one, which is the things we don't know that we know. Yes. Zizek calls that the most important one. The things we, we do, I mean, things that we don't, so that's why I'm going to make sure I got it right. The things that we don't know, we know. Right. And that's uh, in a Lacanian sense, that would be called the real. Right. Um, no, it would be called the symbolic. Right. So, um, you know, th that we don't even know that we know these things. I mean, so, the, you know, all I think, uh, uh, Zizek calls it, you know, all the prejudices, presuppositions, frameworks that we operate within that we don't even see, right? The conditions of us making any statement, right? They're basically the things that have to exist before we can say anything. So in that way, that's the, he's going back to the kind of critical project, the critique, right? Uh, you know, what are the conditions of saying, of making any statement, whether it's a theoretical statement or a historical statement, um, and, um, and for me, I think oftentimes, uh, both history and theory, I know I have a hard time disentangling them, I have to admit, uh, because I think I teach, I treat history, uh, through, I don't know, I treat them both at the same time. Um, 
is a way of uncovering those, you know, this way of remembering the things that we forgot that we know um, in order for us to be able to think something else. Um, that, mm -hmm. by definition, I can't define what that something else is, but to kind of create uh, some kind of crack or fissure or vector, uh, I guess a Deleuzian thing would be a swerve in, in knowledge that we no longer have to remain, you know, trapped within those uh, things that we forgot we know we know. And uh, so for me, it's always a kind of, it's an instrument, it's a sort of an instrument towards the imaginary, I guess. It's an instrument towards another configuration. I think that's what Foucault meant when he, he hoped his histories were histories whose uh, truth lay in the future, right? Um, what, I, what I like about your consistent reference to the real, the imaginary, and the symbolic, right, which is to Lacan's triad, right. which is which is what makes it a, to me a theory is that it, or and a word I would maybe substitute is a structure, like that structure, the real, the imaginary, symbolic can be used to explain so many damn things out in the world uh -huh. that it, I don't know if it's like, it's not so much that it's true to me. It's not so much that it's true or eternal or essential. It's just useful in so many different contexts that you can just, it allows you to compare things that you otherwise wouldn't allow you, you couldn't compare. That is that it's structure, it stays stable and it organizes other things. So theory. Yeah, it's an instrument. Organizes a lot of things with one little triad. Yeah, right? the theory is something that does that. It basically says like there's like, you know, the theory of relative, it's like all this stuff going on in the world, but in fact, it's only a manifestation of this one little thing. And, you know, that's why theory is like foundation, like it's, so there's that kind of theory that's structural, unchanging, or at least explains a lot of things. But then there's the speculative part of theory that does say, yeah, but is that really true? <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh yeah, there are like it's never proven and closed, but it also is like it's a structure. It's hard to tear down those structures. Yeah. Um, so anyhow, like I like I don't I use the that imaginary symbolic um, real in my own thinking. I think I don't talk. I don't write about it, but I often try to think like, does it fit in that structure? I'm like, oh shit, that's amazing. In theory, so then the, my question would be, what for architecture? What is that stable? Yeah, what is the stable, it doesn't have to be a triad, but what is our what is that structure that explains so much phenomenon? I don't know. I mean, well, I, Druvia has tried to do it for sure. I, I see Robin Evans, I think, made an attempt in translations from drawing to building when mm -hmm. he posited this idea that it would be possible to write a history of architecture that would not be based on symbolism or meaning or style but would be made based on it's he called it the manners of working right um yeah and then he followed a lot of that a lot of such a a lot of a much of a history of architecture as the manners of working in other words how does architecture constant how do how do we work what do we do uh, yeah. would be around the question of the translation from drawing to building yeah. um and that you know the drawing to building is not something to resolve but as um um you know, an, an inimical part of what it what constitutes architectural thought itself so i you know it seems like that to me that i read that as a as almost a an attempt to deal with that kind of problem and i i i very much seems to me that we still have to do that i mean that that history still hasn't been written um the history of a manners of working, which is an interesting idea. I mean, because it's sort of how does one, to me, it also reminds me of Foucault's uh, sort of technologies of the self, but at a disciplinary or epistemological level, how does one, you know, con how do, or in the Lusian sense, how does one make construct an assemblage um, uh, for architecture in any one time? I think that's a kind of interesting problem that's that remains to be pursued in a way that's a theoretical problem that's a historical problem it's a historical project within a theoretical problem i would guess but this issue of like that like like so you could like let's say you could say that the history of architecture is really the history of what how we work but i can just say that yeah right like that's really the that's really the key thing and then someone can ask like how do you know that <laughs> 
<laughs> and that's required like that requires evidence narrative data points uh, whatever you need to like like that's a that would seem to me that history would be helpful in making that point as opposed to some going some from somewhere else right you'd actually have to say well here's this person did this and that person did that um or it looks like they're doing something very different, but if you look at how they're working, they're doing the exact same thing. So you gotta go back, or you gotta like line up your facts. The empirical, pro the empirical. You don't have to, I guess, but but it does work for. I mean, it literally does work. Yeah, do I, labor I, does labor. The empirical documentation of facts is very important. That's just because I'm an, an unreconstructed Foucaultian, I think. But um, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's like when people, there's all the stories when people, Sanford Quinter told me once, you know, people would like go to Foucault and say, oh, tell me, teach me how to do what you do. And like, well, he would just say, okay, yeah, first thing you do is you go find a topic, go into the archive for about two years and research everything you can on it. Just get all your data in place. Yeah. Then come back to me in a couple couple years. Um, like he's like, there's no I mean, he was an empiricist in that way. You need to find, and in a lot of his project, and I think this is why you know, he and Deleuze, the Deleuzean project and the Foucaultian project actually were quite aligned for a long time. It was based on an, an empiricism, right? Like these are the statements, right? I mean, I've, like archaeology of knowledge just tries to pull away everything. It's like, there's no author, there's no oof, there's no period, there's no precedent. And it gets down to statements. These are things that are said, right? These are these are the facts, right? Yeah. And so he's trying to like get strip everything away until he can sort of deal with just the empirical facts mm -hmm. um, to the to a, to the extent possible in the social sciences, which was his study, um, and so that one can now, you know, basically peel away all the kind of accreted treated layers and then one knows one must understand all the all the statements that are made right uh one one must analyze everything and then understand what are the patterns right within those statements um and so what i think the like what would it so this issue of what's an architectural history like i was trying to like think before like what is an architectural theory as opposed to a theory that architecture uses mm. what's the theory of architecture with the same like you're one of the way i'm reading what you're saying is like okay like if I, what is the what is the archive I would go back to look at to produce an architectural history? So the other thing that I would say I was trained to be skeptical of was people doing social history and claiming to be doing architectural history or political history and claiming to be doing architectural history. And this or, is one thing that was I, I what history between social history or something like well, that. like do it like studying uh well it's like 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 legal like what are the legal uh no that's too specific it's um trying to trying to explain architecture through a non-architectural phenomenon so uh, you know uh -huh. a law that a law that's not like about professionalism or i can't think about something like well, let's say uh, slavery or right to votes or civil rights Right, right. So let's look at the civil rights, the history of civil, let's look at architecture as a function of civil rights legislation. It's like, uh, it's, it's not unrelated, but it's not quite the same thing. So whenever I'm reading books like that or articles like that, I'm like, well, when are they going to start talking about like plans and buildings and rooms, but they never do. Right. And, and that's, like, it's not that it's not history, it's just that I don't think it's architectural history. Right. So to me, architectural history always has to deal with- It's architecture the and- The design part, the stuff that you were saying, the design part of the beat. Like if you're not talking about design as part of it, then I don't think you're talking about architecture. It's looking at sort of architectural, say matter, I guess we could call it, or facts within a social history. And yet it hasn't gotten to the point of problematizing the architecture itself, right? I mean. So I feel I feel to this day like like the people who call themselves historians are like you're not, like to me like you're not a historian you're not dealing with these social political things that influence architecture it's like I mean one I am but two I'm not substituting that for the stuff that I that we why we're in this field like yeah it doesn't determine. I mean it won't those social historical contexts can't determine the field it can be imminent to it but it doesn't have to determine it 
But just like Lacan can't be either, right? Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, you can certainly have a kind of framework that it, you can have a kind of explanatory framework. I don't think that's what we're talking about, you know. Um, you, know you put everything through the sieve. You put everything through the machine, a theoretical machine, and it comes out the other end. And you know, there you go. Um, and that certainly does exist. Um, um, so, or I also, or treating architects like they, I, there's a version of that, I think, which is uh, treating architects like, I guess, as naive bumblers, yeah. right? Which happens a lot. Like, oh, they were say they did this. They said they were all been to the, like, whatever they were, networks or, you know, whoever uh, technology, but actually they're totally ignorant and they don't have any clue. Uh, and so, you know, architecture is the kind of bumbling idiots of, of history, I think also exists. It's sort of, it seems like it's like an overcompensation for the megalomaniac, me megalomaniacism that we yeah. tend to find in the field. But um, and that doesn't seem to be architectural history either. So, um, but I think history is a, I mean, I, 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 it's a very strange thing. I teach the history and theory, I teach in the history and theory courses. And I teach a course from 1958, 1950 to the present. It used to be 1968 to the present. And I always, always joke that uh, I never really bought this idea of the post histoire uh, until I started teaching students that were born after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, I get it now. You know, you guys don't live historically. I mean, it is, it is a different, uh, I mean, the modality is historically in the sense that the post of storm was used as a kind of grand historical struggle between, you know, a dialectical, a Hegelian dialectical struggle between, you know, op opposing ideologies. It's just uh, that kind of grand narrative is not how people just exist. Um, mm. Um, I mean, it was amazing to me when, you know, I was teaching these things and you can't, I mean, it's obvious in hindsight, but, um, you know, um, again, they're the sort of things that even as a professor, as a teacher, you know, oh, I forgot I knew, I knew that. Hmm. Um, and that one has to reconstruct what, what history means. And I always, I teach history as if it's a technology class or a structures class. Um, um, as in, this is really, these are useful things for, these are use, history and theory are useful. They are instruments. It's how you know what you do. It's how you know how to construct oneself or one's manners of working or one's identity as an architect. Um, you know, how do you constitute the discipline? Um, because in a way that there is, you know, the discipline is a comp, is, you know, the, the boundaries the disciplinary boundaries are a bit fluid or amorphous yeah. uh, how do you know something's interesting or not interesting how do you make judgments um, um, and how do you position yourself uh, within that that fluid condition so I, I almost I, I try to teach it almost like um, as, as, a, as very instrumental right and that history is something that in a Deleuzean sense, I guess, can be remapped and rediagrammed continuously. So one can construct a project around something that existed in the second century BC, 1500 and yesterday, right? And that these things are, uh, that different projects can be constituted around the, the constructing different diagrams through these historical materials, these facts. And so it's not sort of a, they're not it's not sort of a cemetery of dead facts but it's a uh well i guess a, i don't know what i would say a constellation or a, uh how, but how how you thread those facts and this is like maybe like a when I mean, you mentioned right at the beginning is that this, evening, that this issue of does that like you need to you need to be engaged or steeped in design let's say i think to, to do some of these things so so for example like when someone puts together you know who connects something from the 18th century to now and says there's a there's a link like uh -huh. not a kind of like like oh i can i got the paperwork here uh -huh. like that these two things are are saying very similar things like i don't like like those are like okay i've got to go back to the 18th century and uncover it and say okay that's that's interesting but 
artifact or document again a, a data point is what word i want to was, was trying to be generic and saying this this it resonates with this thing going on now now does that make me a historian i don't really think so no and i don't even think i don't know if it makes me a theorist it makes me a designer <laughs> it's like i got like a four i got i got like you know, I don't know, 50 year old couple and I got air conditioning. Like, like, like how is that, how am I supposed to know like the psychology of a 50 year old couple and like how air conditioning works? Like, but I, I know they go together. And like somehow like, like that's what we do too with, um, with ideas across time, let's say that we bring those things together. Now, again, I don't know what to call that. It's, it's like kind of like historical fiction or, you know, it's narratives. I like doing that. I know. I know. I like reading it, and I like doing it. Uh -huh. I also know there's a little looseness there. Like I can just put anything together, right? That kind of like. like can you? That pumpkin. <laughs> I think. Yeah, I I can try at least for sure. Maybe not successfully. I guess would be the question. Would be does it resonate? If successful, then you can put it together. What's that? I mean, if it's not successful. Yeah. Then it didn't work. No one. Yeah, wouldn't have gone. To the experiment didn't work. So now you've proved that that doesn't work, I guess. Like if I have to like make, let's say if I have to find a historical like line, like the like genealogy that connects those two things, like one, by the time I do that, I'll be dead. Uh, and two, I'm not so sure if it really, really if necessarily would help. So, okay, then this question is like, when is his, when do you need history as a tool to say, no, 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 no. Like, this is what happened. He just, these statements were made and these statements were not made. Like sometimes that's productive and sometimes like, eh, how do I make those connections? I don't know. I think uh, I'm very loose that way. I'm not, and maybe if, if I'm not a historian because I'm not so, I'm more interested in finding those connections than I am in like finding the ones that really line up. Uh. So if I have, it's not so much that I, one is, if I have to choose, oh, I just can't choose history because I don't think I've ever really done it. <laughs> I've used it. I've used other people's, but I haven't done it myself. Right. That makes sense. I mean, you mean history in the kind of very kind of straightforward, very straight history, I guess I would call it. Straight no chaser history. I mean, a little bit of that. Uh, like, when, like, when was this building built? Right. Yeah. Just going into the going into an archive and just documenting a kind of pure empirical uh, well, look, for a long time, I think I probably thought like uh, Machu Picchu was built like, you know, with the Romans. It turns out, or from what I understand, historically, it was built in like the 16th century. Right. It's really more of a Renaissance building than it is, right, an ancient building. Like that's, that's an important fact to have. Uh -huh. like, that makes a difference to me. So that's what I mean by like, like those, like, like, I don't know, like, having those things that are, I don't know if they're incontrovertible, but they're, they're no, like they're different. Like that, that, that makes me make different connections knowing those facts. So those things I, that's why I hope people keep doing those things. Right. Yeah. I think that's, I mean, there's, there's, there's the history. I guess it's very dry history. And then there's the, um, we would call it dry, right? Um, just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. Yeah. Um, well, in, in our, in yeah, our question, it's not, that's not fun to me. Doing that kind of history would not be fun. I would not want to do that. I would not be good at it. I don't have the patience for it, but I recognize that it's important All right. and useful. I would never say like, ah, everything can be made up. No, 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 no. that's not true. Yeah, no, I can't, right? It's, it's back to the Latour and gravity is gravity. Like we, we just, it, just because like we discovered it and it's, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Right. And you have to deal with it. Um, so those things are, those things are, are useful. It's, you know, a lot of people complain, you know, like, the, like, well, that people, students don't know like that the Baroque came after the Renaissance. What's like, the Baroque? Like that's, the, it's, I think like chronology is not unimportant. Yeah, yeah, sure. Although, I mean, I, I did propose once we've tried this at Rice, uh, we taught history and theory backwards. Yeah, that would be fun. We taught it from the present to the past, which I've, I've thought about that. It seems hard. 
it's a little tricky. Um, but in one, one, you know, one premise was purely pragmatic of like, I think they need to know about contemporary architecture before they're juniors, uh, right? It's ridiculous. So they're gonna pick up all this stuff and, and maybe we should begin to sort of say, why? Why are we talking about some buildings and not others? Why are we talking about some architects and not other architects? Um, and that one answer is, you know, the, I mean, the, the least interesting answer is just, well, this is what is, this is what's interesting. Uh, this is what's what's hip and happening. But you know, the question is why? Um, why aren't we talking about everything else? Um, but I mean, another version of it would be is why is, for example, why is the Baroque relevant now? Right versus, or you know, why was it so relevant? Why why did the Baroque become a uh, something that was had a contemporary presence, um, say in the mid '90s, uh, while say something like uh, the Renaissance cl Renaissance classicism had a real presence in the '50s, and even would say you know say in the '70s um, with a kind of Palladian uh, Palladianism. So. Um, but you, you, you're, and you're sort of seeing that right now where on my feed, my professional feed, let's call it, mm -hmm. like the kind of need to look at, you know, African-American architects and women architects, you know, the work that's been uh, done by people who have generally been excluded from history books. Um, right. And, and that is left, I think, to the people I know who call themselves historian, this is emboldened. It's like, this is our moment. Like we have like, and it turns out that there's a pretty good archive on that stuff. I mean, it's not as expensive as you would, maybe they would want, but it's like, well, since like, especially since 2005, I've noticed like there has been an explosion of work on that stuff. So they're ready. Like this moment they were like ready for. People have been studying that, but it has right. not been instrumentalized. And this is a moment now it seems that it might be instrumentalized, meaning well, one meaning that it might enter into the studio, that people want to bring it in art in pedagogy, like want to take it out of history theory and into into design. And what I was talking to my PhD advisor, Sylvia Levin, who said, yeah, our history theory is always the kind of avant-garde. We're always kind of doing these things over here. People don't think it's really relevant, but then when the time comes, it's like, oh no, we were ready for you. <laughs> really? We've been working on that. Uh, I don't know. Simon just because I'm a contrarian, I would almost reverse it. I think the designers are ahead and we're catching up. Yeah. I don't know. Part of me thinks like, yeah, maybe they're, maybe it's just, we don't recognize what's in, maybe we haven't discovered what's interesting yet. I don't know. Cause it seems like. Yeah, no, I mean, I, mean, I almost reverse it. I mean, even if they don't know that they know what they're doing. Um, I don't know. It's, it's a curious thing. I seem, but I don't know, just cause I'm a, I'm a contrarian that way. I was like, really? I don't know. I don't. I guess I don't have that confidence that I have much. Well, I would say there's, yeah, I, I don't know either. Cause I don't think like we were like history theory people were talking about the digital, let's put it that way. Yeah. Um, but we were talking about like Foucault and, and you know, so I guess there's, there's a, there are moments that that happens. Like there are historical moments that, that what she said is true and historical moments, which she said that's just not true. All right, I think we're supposed to let Manuel back in at some point. Manuel, are you supposed to come back? It's six forty nine. Sure. On, you know, Manuel is staring at me the whole time. Up, oh, oh, hey, I just looked at my clock. I think we've been going for 40 45 minutes, so you said something about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. great. We'll, we, I think, we'll have uh, some questions from the audience. We it's do. been great, thank you. But uh, uh, we, have, we have a question by Candela Valcarcel, who's, uh, who's in the studio with David, and, and she, she says, bringing back today's. Studio 5 jury, um, relating to the concept of the vertical abattoir, abattoir, right? Yeah, the slaughterhouse, where, where it seems to be connected in terms of its criticism to certain society's paradigms about the typology and its strong relationship with history. To what extent do you believe the role of theory is introduced in this investigation or this research? And she goes on, rather than the theoretical approach to skyscraper, skyscraper typology theory, or maybe Rainer Banham well-tempered environments, which theoretical approaches do you believe are relevant to the vertical laboratory discussion? Did you do a vertical abattoir? Was that the program? Yeah. <laughs> 
See, I told you I can connect anything. That's amazing. That's pretty gutsy. I mean, it's amazing because it like makes total sense. Like I hear about it, and I'm like at the same time, it's uh, like is it possible to be simultaneously flummoxed about uh, to think like an idea is is at the same at, the, at one moment completely obvious and also incredibly improbable. Yeah. You know, it's like great. That's a great problem. It's like the. Uh, very nice. Well, I, yeah, I asked the students if they thought that too. I mean, I think, well, to Candela's question, I mean, maybe, I don't know, there's somehow there's two questions in there to me, but uh, the one I want to answer is that like, there is this kind of societal problem about uh, our treatment of other species and our relationship to, other, let's say our relationship to other species and other entities, air, water, cows, chickens, Birds. Um, but okay, so as an architect, how do I engage that issue? Like, I don't, like, I can't do it as a biologist or an ecologist. I can only do it through, well, not only, but I think the, the way I can add specificity to that issue is engaging it through a design problem. Type being one way of thinking of that. Um, whether or not type is is well, type is not an architectural concept. In you know, it's a it's a theory, right? It, it can be used in different places and can be used and it's been used dangerously in different places. But um, so so to me, it's as a citizen, I can engage it politically, no question about that. Or I can engage it like as a consumer, like don't eat meat or do, do whatever. But as an architect, it seems to me I can only engage it by designing something that tries to bring out that problem in, a, in, in an architectural way. Now that, that, that's hard for me, I'm putting scare quotes up, but what does that mean in an architectural way? One way is by drawing it in, in, very in certain conventional ways. So to me, um, that's, what we can, that's what we can do. Now, it's also true that I, I have read ecological theory and economic theory about environment and ecology, you know, like, so that's informed me, but ultimately as an architect, that's, I have to get involved through, yeah, through the making or proposing. It doesn't have to be actually made, which is what we try to do. So, mm. so that uh, is more about architectural as a discipline than it is about history theory, I don't think, I think, but anyhow, I'll stop there. But did, you, did you guys read uh, Rainer Bannum's Mechanization Takes Command? Uh, Siegfried Gideon, uh, no, I, it was on the list. I, I, yeah, it was on the list, but we, I didn't, I didn't, uh, hardcore assign it. I'm just asking because I, for me, that's one of the most, I mean, I was, uh, when I was doing my PhD, that was one of the most amazing books to sort of encounter. It's one of those books that I didn't know about yeah. when I was doing history and theory. And you read this, we're like, what the hell? I mean, it's this moment of, is this guy, what was this guy smoking? Uh, <laughs> But then you read it, and well, there's a came whole up today in the review a couple of times about the mechanization of death, right? The the abattoir and um, there's all those uh, photographs of of carcasses, animal carcasses, and uh, the mechanization. Now I'm getting confused. Like now, now the whiskey is going, used to doing its work, meaning that like I remember scanning it, but now and, and I remember did we read? Did we discuss it? I don't know. Maybe I gave it to them. I don't remember discussing. Oh, they'll have to remind me. But it's a great. Maybe we'll get an answer. It's a great text, and and it has this whole discourse about. Um, yeah. Well, anyway, was, images. And you did the mechanization of death. I'm like, wait a minute. I know that. Yeah, and in some ways, it's trying to deal with the holo the the aftermath of the Holocaust and World yeah. War II. Oh. Oh. But in a larger way, it's trying to deal with this question of humanism and 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 what is what is humanism. Um, and what is our relationship to the non-human and the inhuman? And you know, of course, then he he shifts. You know, the next the next body of work immediately after that is the eternal present. And one of the interesting things, just from a historical point of view, and when I was doing the PhD, I, I found uh, uh, that the RIBA in London has a, a huge archive of Gideon's writings between mechanization takes command and the eternal present. Um, and it's very interesting how he pivots uh, during that period um, 
uh, from the problems of mechanization takes command and this anxiety about technology and uh, the uh, and humanism into uh, uh, a search into the past um, and into say cultural forms and a kind of almost archa um, archaeological or archetypal uh, you know looking in the past for for forms yeah. that will persist uh, as a way of, of creating a resistance um, so it's very you know there there's sometimes you know, those historical moments and it's very interesting what he uh, how he's utilizing things but I, I was just curious if you guys so on one hand yeah I mean it's uh, you know that the bodies of the animals are are in a way stand-ins right they are um, they they stand in for us, right? Um, it's interesting um, how I mean that's an example of this kind of interjection. I would say I don't know. It's very interesting. So I don't know what history and theory would be, but it's interesting to urbanize that. What is it to urbanize the slaughterhouse or densify it? I guess it gets very big. Would you see? Do you see cows on the fourteenth floor eating oysters with boxing gloves? Um, there, I, were some, there were some projects today. Well, that was one of the discussions I think today was like, do you expose, like, what would it mean to exhibit that to the city, right? Like as a, here it is, both as a kind of monument, but also like actually, you know, the cows don't need windows, like you sew them. As but, opposed to a kind of like, I think there were, I don't know, there were more than two strategies, but definitely there were people who were like, no, 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 we're going to hide these things away. And it's kind of like a kind of a power, like a you know a, an infrastructural building. Like nope, don't look here. Nothing yeah. to see. Or here it is. Uh, and what does each one reveal? But that's but, a, getting away from the topic, I think. So, but do you think that's actually? It's from, to me, it strikes me as in some ways similar to uh, last year's topic, which was the data center. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and yeah, right. So then the one before that was like today. Like it, I, I think it upped the ante by like putting in a live thing, like. It's like if you put corn, like eh, but you all of a sudden like the beast people get un get intrigued, uncomfortable. Yeah, it was, yeah. I mean, in both it was cases, fun. right? Whether a data center, and the, you know, is the cloud, right? The the entire ideology of you know cloud computing and data we, center, supposed to be invisible. Like you're not supposed to see that stuff, right? It's supposed to be frictionless. Frictionless capitalism, instantaneous, and and the the massive infrastructures uh, that are required to to for that virtual right. That that in making invisible is this. I would say the food chain supply in in the kind of it's the same thing in late capitalism or whatever advanced capitalism, right? I'm not supposed to know where my I don't know where my green beans come from. They just come like it just appears. I go to the store. The somehow it got there. I don't need to know, right? shows up on your, you know, it's like, here it is, right? And uh, uh, in front of you. So is, I mean, I don't know how, like, again, the question is like, what is architecture's role in reveal? We talked about this, like revealing, hiding, like at one point we were talking about like the pornography of it, like of like making it explicit, right? What happens when you make it like, hey, here it is. Look at this. How do you feel about this, right? Warhol's line about Far like, the way you find out if somebody what their sexual orientation is, is show them pornography and figure out what they get aroused to, right? That was his definitely, like, that's how you would know, right? The My kids, is that what you're saying? <laughs> I'm just saying, like, if you see a cow, like, in the building, like, what what happens, right? Like, oh, I don't want to eat. So, nice cow. Wow. And people are like, okay, good, give me more. We have another question by Anna Fon, and I think it's uh, for Chris, but, it would, but I think it would be for both, that it's, it's the- um, One question. Uh, yeah, what? Sure. Okay. No, if if you were to to teach history uh, backward from the present to the past, as you said, the question is which would be the the first building you would show today? A project from the past, from the present to the past. Yeah. What day of the week is it? Thursday. Oh, we're gonna, all right. Well, 
I don't know. I don't have an. I don't have a single answer to that. I think it's it's. Um, I mean, in a way, you can start with any building. I mean, I, you can sort of. I mean, it's sort of like reverse engineering it. Um, so you can start, I think, either with a problem or a discourse that exists. Like, you know, if you're interested in ideas of the affect, or if you're interested in, say, in uh, issues of ecology, or say, race uh, or gender and architecture, or whatever you're, whatever. The, so you can start, I think, with a kind of topos, a topic, or I think you can just start with a building. Um, that seems to have some significance. Um, and you sort of reverse engineer it and to say, and to question, well, is it significant? Um, why is it significant? It's easier if you go on the path. The present is very, very hard. Um, um, I mean, I, I freely admit I sort of stop around the Rolex Learning Center because it's like I can't tell you if a building like that was published yesterday. I mean, it's it's it doesn't really work. Uh, you have to have some lag time, I think, um, um, or at least that's the student's job. They can they can deal with the present. Um, uh, but I at least exercise because I think it's very important to be I, skepticism. I do think is important. Um, um, and I always tell my students never trust architects. Uh, you know, it's one of the hardest things in a way is to, in the history of theory course, it's like, you know, architects are liars. Uh, just an architect says something doesn't mean it's true in any sense of that word. All right. Um, and yet you find architects like regurgitating what architects say about their buildings all the time. It's like, A, it may or may not be true. B, it may or may not be interesting. Right. So, you know, you, I think an incredible dose of skepticism is is the first step. But say you find a, a building. I think it's I don't know. It's, it depends on what I'm what I'm uh, looking at today. Um, so um, I will say I, I had a strange experience. Uh, I was recently going on a road trip and I. Um, And uh, we were driving through Alabama, and we stopped in Tuskegee, Alabama, which actually was where I was born. I was born in this tiny little town called Tus Tuskegee, Alabama, which has one of the oldest uh, historically African-American uh, colleges. Uh, and then I was born there because my father was teaching architecture there. Um, and some of my earliest memories were of the chapel uh, there that was designed by Paul Rudolph in 19 and it was finished in 1969. And it's this amazing building that has kind of been forgotten. I mean, it's kind of lost to history for many reasons. Um, and many reasons I don't know about. And, uh, um, in a way, I, I mean, that was a moment where I was like, Oh, this is a real, like, I could start with this building. Right. Um, uh, you know, if one wants to talk about, say, relationship of landscape to building or problematize the object in relationship to context, I think, you know, like that would be, you know, you, I think you could start with, with that was an experience where I, as far as like, first of all, it's an incredibly powerful building. Um, um, it's doing an incredible amount of sophisticated things. I mean, it's absolutely phenomenal. Um, if it was, you know, if it was like where the Carpenter Center is, you know, it would be talked about all the time, right? Um, but it is lost for many reasons. Uh, but it's an absolutely stunning work of architecture. Um, and you can see a lot of contemporary issues uh, worked through within it. Um, so I don't know. I think you can sort of, you can just find buildings that are uh, important and unwrap them. And I don't know if it's, necessary to start i guess I'm go to the present go to the back one of the one of the important things about that is you can the, the premise behind that was like okay here is why the renaissance is relevant or here is why the baroque is relevant to this discourse um to this architect here is why xyz is important um and how how they are constructing an architectural an architecture uh idea right or like the architecture without not constructing out of bricks but constructing as a concept um through these other uh matters uh and so it's uh uh so mm -hmm. I, don't, 
Pick a kind of part of the architect. I don't know what I would start with. I would start with Paul Rudolph's Chapel. Today, I would start with Paul Rudolph's Chapel and try to untangle that. Like, what the hell? You know, um, uh, I think that's a kind of interesting thing. Um, I think can... like producing like syllabi are an incredible, like a, a sequence of classes. Like, that's not a book, right? That's like a series of lectures and assignments. Like, and trying to thread that is such a difficult and productive thing because like that's what I, I was trying to think like okay because man was going to ask me that and I also have the problem I have no idea in the next last five years but like I started to think like okay well if I did CCTV tower right that seems like both I like the building I could get excited about it I could talk about politics and surveillance and then I could talk about like Chartra. <laughs> And, and like, I, or I could figure out a way of getting back to something before, but that's a little too heavy hand. Or I also, then I think like, okay, that's like so heavy handed. Like, how do I avoid that kind of thing? So like the, the first one, it's a good, it's a good problem like to have, but only not because what's the first, it's like, what does that then like lay out? Like you sort of have, it sets you up to do but you have to run through, you have to figure that out. You can't just do it on the fly. I mean, you can do it on the fly, but you're gonna get in trouble, I think. Um, but where you start makes a difference. So like starting with that building would make a difference where you would end up, I would think. I think what we're getting, I think what's coming out of here is, is whether one's talking about say a totalizing history, like where one constructs a history that this is, this is everything you need to know and it's a kind of stable formation. Um, I guess we call it comprehensive. Um, kind of comprehensive view of history or if one's pursuing it more as a kind of uh, incisive moments, right? Uh, 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 formations in history. Um, so it's, you know, whether it's a survey or overview or whether you're sort of boring in deeply, but not, not providing an overview. I think that's also a kind of challenge um, is, is figuring out. Yeah. Just, I was thinking about your answers, but just trying to make a little bit more general the question. How do you use history and how do you use theory for start for starting? You know, like to start, because you, I, I, I could see you guys uh, searching in different ways where to start, right? Um, and, and yeah, I'm curious about. How do you use history and how do you use theory and in which ways they they combine or, or which roles they have when when starting you know when starting what, whatever um, these type of questions or when or when deciding where a, a studio should start and, and which text you should read first and so on you know. I know. Yeah, I don't know. There's a lot of questions. I think I use I, I use history to bolster some like or to support some intuition, conjecture, relationship. So not to prove and not to like fake it either. Like I, yeah. I mean I really mean like support, like help. <laughs> to me and if you can't find it, then you then yeah, then the whole thing then is come crumbling down. But I think um, yeah, I think it's, it's very, it can be very useful. Let's put that like it can help. Um, it's not just a rhetorical, like, you know, like helps your argument by, by saying, oh, but this is, this, this is true, but it's sort of, um, yeah, it scaffolds what you otherwise can't really, you can't really prove. I guess like this I like proof or truth or like like that's it's what it's one of the best kinds of evidence that one would have to support to support things so I don't know if I would ever that's why I would like to me I can't imagine starting with history like it's 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 useful it's not like but it's not an end and it's it's I, I use it more so I guess also probably more selectively or meaning like what can I, what, how can it help me? So, and the danger of that is that you're, you're just cherry picking things that you want and you're ignoring other things. I mean, I was, I mean, I think I was trained well enough by Foucault, like Foucault's logic of like, you got to get all the statements. 
So meaning that when I pick, I hope when I pick, I have already, I have a kind of like selection and I know why I pick one and not the other, but yeah, it's risky. Theory well, is there, risky. Is no, there, I mean, there's no single history, right? I mean, there are, I mean, it's like you can never get the comprehensive total view, right? Of everything. Though I grew up thinking that's true, but yes. yeah. Well, yeah, we all kind of were taught that. And then we realize there are many different histories. Um, um, uh, some of which are accurate and some of which are inaccurate. Um, but you can have multiple histories that are both, you can have different histories that are both both true in some ways. Um, I don't know, it's interesting. I think for me, I, I do tend to treat, I would say I tend to treat history as the kind of field of facts, the field of statements. Um, um, and that um, instead of say a Hegelian kind of point of view where it's like, well, okay, and all these things can be understood within some sort of theoretical structure, like say the dialectic, right? Um, the historical dialectic, right? Because this is Hegel. Hegel had a theory of history. It was called the historical dialectic and da da da, da. And You have things like the, the zeitgeist and, and you know, um, the, 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 the movement of history through this kind of dialectic and so on and so forth, or you have a you know, Marxist version of it and so on and so forth. So you have a theoretical armature that sort of attempts to make sense of all those historical facts and tells you, well, this is significant and that's not significant. This is evidence of this and this is evidence of that. And then other things are just not covered. Um, so um, I try to approach thing history as a kind of a field of facts, but instead of seeing it as a kind of, um, I guess, uh, positioning those things within a singular framework that somehow unfolds both chronologically um, and um, uh, to see it as a kind of field that can be remapped right at any given time um, and again some of those configure so some some mappings are just wrong or right? they just won't work some are kind of crackpot but will work right somehow right uh, and uh, some are really relevant um, but I think it's, um, you know, that uh, if, if one begins to at least have a kind of skeptical or critical position, and then, I don't know, I think it does allow oneself to position oneself vis-a-vis -vis the contemporary world in a way that does, I don't know, uh, yield potential condition. So you're not just, I mean, my hope would be so that one is not trapped by, oh, this is what we learned. You know, this is what we learned is important, or this is what like this says is important now, or this is hip now, two months later, you know, we'll be on to something else. I, I, I because to me, that's um, not very interesting. So, you know, um, uh, I think for me, it's a uh, history tends to be those fields of facts that can then be reconfigured and remapped, a kind of constellation. And depending on the problem one is, that one is dealing with, some become very prevalent and some kind of recede. But it's constantly being remapped and reshuffled, right? Um, uh, according to one's problems and, and, and the problems that are presented within a larger context. So uh, it's not static and it's not, it's not sort of dead weight. Um, and the Renaissance, what we mean, say, by the Baroque uh, today, for example, is not the same as what the 17th century was. I mean, like the, even the facts don't remain static, right? They are they are also remade and reshuffled, even as they also retain their factness. Um, and so we have to understand that as well. So I think it's for me, it's. Uh, that, it, it happens in science too, right? I mean, like what was considered truthful, relevant, important, morphs. Right. And sometimes. If you, if we still believe things that people believe. They, I mean, that were taken as not like, not as be, make believe, but as like, no, 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 we figured this out, right? We've got it. Only to find out mm, you didn't get it, right? So to me, it's also this kind of moving. <laughs> I mean, that's always like when I went back, like when, there was some point where I, like you would go to the library and you'd read something like let's say from the 50s, and, uh, you know, written in the 50s and you're like, okay, here's what this is. And you're like, okay, yeah, that's, it's in a book in a library. It must be true. 
But if you don't figure out that like, no, 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 in the 70s, somebody figured out that that was wrong. You know, so this, this issue of uh, one that the facts are changing or, and, or that you can rearrange them, that kind of, one needs to be supple, right? To do that and to recognize that. I think that's where for me design, like thinking like a designer is helpful. Yeah, I think I, I think we're both saying, I mean, I think we, I, I, I probably think of myself more as a designer, but I happen to work with stuff. My stuff happens to be history. Um, and my techniques happen to be theoretical, you know? Um, but I think I approach it, but I think it's, uh, I think Manuel Delana kind of called it hat. He referred to hacking, you know, like, like he's like, I'm not a philosopher, but I sort of hack philosophy as sort of a hacker's ethic. There's the hacker ethic and the designer ethic is a little bit, um, it has something to do with it, but they, they you know, you're, you're, you're putting, you're, you're not looking for a comprehensive overview. You're trying to put this with this to get it to do something else. Right. Um, um, so like Manuel would say, like, I'm going to, we're going to hack philosophy here. Um, we're going to know enough about this and this and this and this in order to be able to understand that, right. How this works. Um, so I think that's kind of useful, but I think the designer, but I also think that designer's point of view, I think it brings, I think that that manner of working also brings with it, um, certain questions that doesn't that otherwise wouldn't occur um so i don't know yeah it, it takes me a little bit to the beginning of your conversation i think it was david that said uh, history is something you you expect but you never get right like uh, well i'm paraphrasing a, a little bit well i uh, thought i was gonna get it yeah i thought i was like like someone's just gonna say, "Here it is. Here's how you do it. Here are the rule. Like you know, like uh -huh. I never. Or they're gonna. Someone's gonna sit you down and say, "Here it is. Like and here's how. You, here are the tools. Like we didn't tell anybody else, right? It's like that secret that you get. That's why I was that it's uncomfortable. Someone was gonna do that with me for theory. That didn't happen either. Well, actually, it happened twice. But uh, someone did do it with me, I guess. Um, Whereas in design, it's almost like like you know every studio and structure you get gives you like here it is here's how you do it. <laughs> but I never got that with with. Academia. But I guess the the funny thing about design though is you're sort of getting it right like so here's what you do, um, but often it's presented as a matter of fact, right? Like here's how you do it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not like and the question of like why the fuck would I want to do that. Is not okay, like why? What's like we all we drink the Kool Aid and never go. Well, I don't know. Maybe it's like a, maybe I don't, know. I don't want to drink Kool Aid. I mean, it's a or you know, it's like so. Just do this process. You'll produce this architecture. Um, uh, you know. So it's okay. I mean, maybe it's a it's a very, it's a big question, but I I think you've been talking the two of you have been talking in a certain way of a, I don't know a, a trident design history theory like. Um, the, the relationship between them, I think, uh, I don't know, uh, may, maybe it's um, it's good for another conversation because it's uh, a, another whole topic, but at least it's, I think you open it in certain ways. Um, yeah. yeah at, at one point, Chris was saying theory shouldn't be instrumentalized. I mean, that, like saying there is a relationship between design and theory, but it shouldn't be instrumentalized. I don't know, it would be, um, well, in a way, mental, but I don't think it, it shouldn't like justify it. It's not an excuse, right? It's not armor. It's like here, yeah, it's like it is not. Here's what philosophy looks like in architecture, right? Like we have a theory, and here's what it looks. Here's what it looks like in architecture. Like that, I, like that seems silly to me. Yeah, kind of illustrate like architecture illustrates something. Like that's the problem. If architecture is only illustrating something, yeah, that's there's all kinds of things. But when theory like explodes, like, wait, is that how I can think about architecture? I can think about it a different way? Okay, then that's different, but it's not trying to, which I do feel has happened quite often and it's happening right now, or it happened in the last three years or five years with triple O. Well, I don't know, that's, you know, wait, wait a year and it'll go away. Yeah, well, it's already going away. 
So I think, uh, I mean, I've joked before, and I'm probably some of the people here have probably heard of this too. It's like, you know, I've joked that uh, we should, what we usually call the technology classes should be called the history theory classes and the history theory classes should be thought of as technology classes, right? In other words, like we think of structures and things like that. It's like, oh, this is how we do stuff. This is like how to do things. Practical, how we do stuff. History theory is like, this is what stuff means or what stuff is about, right? Uh, this is like the metaphysical uh, discourse. It's not really useful. I don't know. I just have to know about it to be, I don't know, to get into the right clubs, I guess, um, um, to make our architecture significant as opposed to just rudimentary everyday, you know, mm -hmm. practice, whatever it is. Uh, to be erudite, and I was—I always like to flip those on its on its sides of that and say, in some ways, right today, the technological questions are pose, you know, real theoretical, metaphysical questions, right? So, like, meat, right? Uh, avatars, um, um, uh, data centers, uh, air conditioning for data centers. These these are actually the kind of this is the sort of ferment mm. upon which a uh, sort of metaphysical quandary can be posed and um, and are challenging what we think of as the real, right? I mean, so it's like, oh, you know, what, what, that, oh, we also have this meat. Um, whereas history and theory is actually very practical because how do you, how does one in a kind of state of proliferation uh, where you can Google image search anything and there are no clear boundaries or say idiot, the ideologically, the ideological um, boundaries are not very clear, not very well formed. Um, and if you blink, even if you join one like triple O, whatever that, that actually means in architecture, which I don't think anyone knows. Um, if you blink, it'll be gone. Um, history and theory is, becomes a very practical tool for being able to, uh, you know, make decisions about well, why, why, does, why do you, why do you draw this line that way? Why do you draw that line that way? Um, how does one, what is your manner of working, right? Um, and why, why are you choosing this? Why are you, why are you, why do you have this manner of working? And why do you think that's, you know? so I think it's, uh, what is the manner of working that you've received as a student uh, that your professor sort of taught you as like, this is what you do. Uh, as a matter of fact, as opposed to, you know, a choice. So I think that's, to me, I try to, I think it's useful to sort of flip them on their heads and say one is very practical and one is very speculative. Like his, treat the technological things as speculative and the history and theory as practical. Um, I'm going to definitely try that. I like that a lot. It doesn't, I don't know if it works, but. You know. Yeah, right. That's what I'm going to say. I'm going to try it and see how it goes. But it does also make me, if. <laughs> Maybe just because where where I were here, but it makes me think. Yeah, when did that happen? Like, was it always that way? Like, did they flip? And like, what was the historical reason why it flipped? Which is like, you know, the proliferation of data centers and the availability of information. Like, like, like that is there's a. I don't know if there there are answers to that question of like how and why and when it flipped. Well, David, I think you what you were saying, I think with your distinction about like theory about architecture, or you said something else, theory of architecture versus for and of, yeah. Theory for or theory of architecture versus yeah. I think drawing all you were saying there, maybe it never flipped. Maybe it's like we that's just how we constitute. I mean, I think it's very I mean, I I think about, for example, like uh You know, Panofsky's uh, architecture is uh, scholastic form, mm -hmm. uh, or no, architecture of scholasticism by Panofsky, where he talks about Gothic architecture and stained glass windows. And I mean, there's a lot about that in that text. Um, you know, the fly, you know, things like the structural, I mean, the very practical, you know, the structure of a Gothic cathedral, the ability to make stained glass. Um, those kind of materialist, it's like a materialist history in a way, uh, point of view for me. Uh, I mean, his, his Panofsky isn't a materialist history, but, but like sort of, you know, you can, you can see, you know, like the structural innovations as, as in absolute, you know, they, they are uh, inseparable from 
the theoretical problem. I mean, it is a theoretical problem, right? Why would you do it this way? <laughs> um, I think I've had too much too much rye, but um, I don't know. I actually, as far as I say, maybe it's always been that way. Um, and it doesn't, it's never that it's flipped. It's just that at some point we, we put these things into these categories and uh, think they operate that way. But in fact, that that is itself a kind of Platonism like a, uh, that I would want to like inver invert, right? From a, my theoretical point of view, the first thing I want to do is like overturn that kind of Platonism. Like these are ideas, this is the architecture. And you know, like one has to apply one to the other. And I, the first thing I want to do is like, you know, if there are architectural concepts, there are concepts that can only be enunciated through architecture, right? And and if I have if I can describe it in a text, I'm just kind of getting close to it, right? I, mean, I think there, I think it's a, I think there are times when, so I would almost want to say it's, it's always been that way. It's um, it's only our Platonism that gets in the way. Um, All right, I'm gonna. That's I'm definitely. That's my takeaway. Just to, to wrestle with that one. Yeah. Okay, David, Chris, it's been great. Thank you for doing this. It's been really, really interesting. I think we've, we've got plenty to, to go on thinking about. Uh, once again, thank you for, for, for doing this Water and Whiskey. This, this was the, the last of the series, the number eight. We'll be doing another eight uh, next semester. All right. Well, good luck, Chris. Great talking to you. Yeah, it's good to see you, David. It's fun. We should do this more often. Yeah, this is for sure Zoom. Well, maybe. I'll, I've never been to Houston, and if you want to come to Ithaca, please do. Oh, you know what? I, I, you don't want to come to Houston right now. No. no. Uh, no. <laughs> it's bad, bad. Uh, but uh, we're, we're currently, for those of you in Buenos Aires, we're currently the COVID-19 epicenter of the United States. So it's not so right, they Stay safe. Yeah, well, I just I'm I'm existing in my house, uh, so uh, I'm walking around the manual. So yeah, it's all right. You too. It was fun. Zoom all right. Yeah, it was. All right, Manuel. Well, thank you. Thanks everybody down there. Thank you. Yeah, same. Cheers. Thanks. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye, David. Bye.